All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I am so thankful to have uh, all of you here uh, to have another episode of uh, Unstoppable Funding You. And uh, what I want to um, start out with is uh, real quick, is I want to share a couple of uh, success uh, stories right out of the gate. Um, we have uh, Damon. I want to do a quick shout out with Damon. Um, he's on the call with us. Uh, Damon, go ahead and say hello to everybody. If you don't mind, just wave. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Damon, one of the newbies. Yeah, Damon actually uh, started his first uh, transaction with us. Uh, have you? I think you've never. Have you ever flipped a house before, Damon? Before this, this one? Is my first, this is my first flip. His first one, and he uh, purchased this house in Washington D.C. And uh, well, how long ago did you buy that? I acquired the home um, July nineteenth. July 19th, guys. All right. And the good news that we have as of today is? That the house is completed. Um, we are listing it this week. Um, went through a what final uh, walkthrough. What's that? What did you do with the house? What, what did you do? What, well, what did you do as far as your Total rehab. Um, when we got into this property, it was acquired. Um, in a state so prior to us occupying a house the, the house was probably vacant for um for months if not a year uh, before it was it was so bad before we even walked in the house we didn't even really like go down to the basement it was full of spider webs it was three um three rolls of carpet that was soaked it was flooding it was all kind of things going on so it was a total gut yeah, so he did a total. So he did a total gut. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share. So in eight weeks' time, guys, he did a total gut. So I'm going to show you some before pictures that I have, uh, and then and then some after pictures, just re very briefly for us. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit the share button. And um, so what you're going to see here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get to the. Um, Got to minimize this so I can do it, I think. All right. So these are the, so this here is the before pictures. So I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so you can see a little better. So you see this home was needing quite a bit of work. Now, did you do the drywall uh, too? Did you remove all the drywall and start over again, Damon? Pretty much, yes. We knocked down all the wall. Yeah, we knocked all those walls off. That's the main level right there. Um, so as far as the four corners of the home, you know, we that was brick, so that remained, but we knocked all that out to give it an open concept. All right, so this is an idea of what they were before, and he did, he went from that to. All of that in eight weeks, guys. Eight I, weeks. I don't have the, the uh, front picture that wasn't sent to me, but um, I thought this was, uh, I think that was a, a great job, uh, Damon. Um, does any, has anybody, uh, I know I know Alfonso's on the phone with us too. Uh, oh, you, so you didn't get the kitchen, Arn? You didn't get the kitchen? I did not. I did not. Uh, do you want to uh, share that? I can uh, allow you to if you want to. And okay. Al, I sent you the video of the, uh, I don't know if you got the video that we sent you yesterday um, from the staging company. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was on which column though? I, I got my yeah. phone on charge. How Why shit? don't you get that loaded, loaded up? And if we have time at the end of the, at the end of this uh, workshop, we'll show that then. That sounds great. Thank, okay. that, 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 thank you so much for letting us share that. You know, um, it, it's, it's such a learning experience on our, on our first one. And, um, but they are hit or miss. Sometimes, like Karen said, that say sometimes my first one was great. And after that, she had some, had some difficulties. And that's the way it is sometimes. You can't expect them all to go the same. Um, I've, the one I'm doing right now, I've ran into some uh, other glitches. This isn't a one and done situation, though. This is a, uh, really a career we're going to progressively get better at what we do 
uh, we learn from those mistakes. So we want to embrace those mistakes so that we can uh, get the uh, best out of it. At least that's my opinion. Um, so uh, I know that all of us, as, as we do do them, we want to get in, run into a different set of uh uh, difficulties, different set of um, challenges. And it's those difficulties and those challenges and overcoming them that help us to become better and to make more profit and to actually turn this into something that can be a long-term viable way, uh, uh, path towards actually accumulating wealth. And so that, that's what this is all about. So thank you for, for sharing. Um, you know, can always share the good, the bad, um, and then work together and overcoming it is uh, one of the main goals. So uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, transactional funding a little bit later. That's our guest speaker. But I wanted to cover some of the areas that were uh, left uh, a little bit incomplete uh, from the previous class two weeks ago and also last week. So uh, we were touching on at the end of the last class about leverage and uh, Raul had asked me to uh, expand on that. And I um, don't think I covered it uh, in all the aspects. There's one major aspect that I didn't compare it to that he brought out to me when we talked. And uh, when, the, when we talked uh, earlier today, and that is that what we wanted to compare with leverage is uh, using cash or your own money um, or using someone else's or uh, the funding that we provide, okay? And showing you the difference and what that looks like. And so a lot of people will say, well, gosh, your closing costs uh, are like 5,000 bucks or they're like 10,000 or maybe they're 20,000 depending on the size of the loan, okay? And I say, well, uh, you know, I could just, I got enough cash, I'll just pay cash. And maybe they go that route. And I'm not gonna say that's a bad move because there's less security in going cash. But there's some significant uh, things to be aware of. Uh, what we're, what, one of the main reasons to use other people's money or to finance it when you're doing investing in real estate is something called leverage. And when it comes to fix and flips, leverage is really important. What leverage lets you do is to lift more with less. Okay, that's what the definition of leverage, leverage would be. Okay, so... Uh, in an example, if you want to just maybe picture this in your head or jot it down, let's let's assume we have a hundred thousand dollar house that's going to take about forty thousand dollars of the rehab to then be worth two hundred thousand dollars when you sell it. Okay, now we're not going to figure in real estate fees and all that. So if you if you paid cash, you're going to have one hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars into the project. At the end of the day, you sell it, you make sixty thousand minus your marketing cost and all of that. So all of that stuff is going to be equal whether you finance it or not. Now, if you were to use our financing program through Unstoppable Funding, um, uh, uh, the company, Unstoppable Funding, um, what you're looking at there is usually around 10% down on the purchase price. So you'd, you'd have to put $10,000 down. But the closing costs themselves are going to be about the fees and so forth would be around five thousand dollars, okay. And then you're going to also have interest on the use of the money until you sell the property. So you're going to need to figure probably another five thousand dollars. So your cost extra for financing it versus paying cash, and that example would be about ten thousand more dollars that you would have to spend, okay. So if you compare the uh, two examples on a cash deal, you would have made 60,000 financing it. You would have only made 50,000 at the end of the day. Here's the difference though, to do the cash deal, you would have needed $140,000. Now, God bless you if you have it, but that's 140,000 out of your pocket into the deal that's stuck. So your cash on cash return on 140,000, you made 60. So you made maybe 40% uh, there. I didn't do the ratios, but somewhere over 40, maybe as much as 50%. Um, you also don't have any room if something goes wrong, you got a problem at home, maybe you used all your money, maybe you didn't. But nevertheless, 
you got maybe a 40% return. Now, on the other example, you would have had 20,000 of your money tied up and made 50,000. So you'd have made over a 200% return on the cash that came out of your pocket. Now, the other thing is, is that if you did have 140,000 handy, you could have been doing two or three projects at the same time, provided you're hiring people to do uh, the work for you. Uh, so that's what leverage is, because then in the same period of time, you could have, uh, if, if they're exactly the same, in theory, you could have made 80,000 uh, versus um, 80 to maybe 120,000 versus six versus the 60,000 profit. So that's just a very, very crude example of, uh, how, of how leverage uh, can be used uh, to increase your, your actual return. Uh, the other thing um, I wanted to open up for just a couple minutes on the tax sales from last week. Uh, for any of you that have ever viewed the class from before, uh, last week when we had Irina on, or anyone that uh, has watched the video, if you had any questions that we didn't cover, that you still had a couple questions about how to acquire uh, tax sale properties or any questions related to that at all. Hey, Arn, real quickly, if, if we could just back up for one second on the leverage one. Um, there was one other thing that you were talking about that uh, I thought was really important. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning for those who are you know on uh, anything but East Coast time is cash reserves. So we know that like the number one reason most small businesses go out of business, right, is because, yeah, we plan for startup and we plan for all this other kind of stuff. What we don't plan for is the next six months. Right. We're thinking, oh, OK, we'll be we'll be break even or we'll have some revenue coming in within a couple of months. And then we've all been there. Right. We And so doing a project is, you know, when you're an investor, you're a business. Right. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, when you go from all cash to utilizing, you know, finance money, just, you know, anything, you know, you can talk about a little bit in terms of those cash reserves. Anyone that's done construction. I know you've heard the words change order or overage. The scary, I see everyone smiling. Everyone's like, anyone is, they see that change order, they're like, oh man. Yeah. I, gonna look I, like? I mean, you, you're absolutely right. I can tell you that on uh, my own personal project that we, on the home that we purchased in the last series of classes for the class, um, my cost overruns were about 15,000 out of pocket. Um, so, and as, and as a that, percentage that, of your real. budget, what was that like? Wasn't that like 20% over? Was, yeah. So the, yeah, if you relate it to the budget, yeah, it was a 25% over. On average, it's 10 to 20. If you're great, I've seen people say, yeah, I've had like an eight to 10. That's like the, a great metric, but our average was 20% and we've been doing it for like eight years, nine years. And we were still like hitting 20%, 15%. So. Thank, thank you so much, Raul. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and Raul, in case uh, any of you uh, are just joining, and oh, wait a minute, everybody. Araldo, thank you for joining. So I want to let everybody know, Araldo has been very, very sick. Araldo, are you still in the ICU, my friend? I am. I'm about to get transferred oh, into a regular room. Oh, good. I'm That's glad you're getting, great I'm glad news. I am glad you're getting thoughts to you, man. I was going to ask everybody to say a prayer for you, but here you are. So, um or, 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 or Araldo reached out to me from the uh, ICU room uh, Friday uh, by video. And there he is. And uh, just because he, you know, he just uh, really, I don't know, I was I was more moved by the fact that you reached out. I can't even tell you how much that Im impressed me that you got, that you felt uh, to do that. I mean, we only know each other from, from here, guys. We don't, we're not, haven't been friends anywhere else, but we've become uh, to, to know each other and he's been supporting the group. So Geraldo, we all are wishing you well uh, you know, you. and a speedy recovery. You've been there for an ICU for how long? Um, since the 10th, so since 10 days now. So, well, we wish you a speedy recovery. For, for those of you who don't know, we work with Geraldo's company quite a bit. Uh, Geraldo's company provides um, funding uh, for us for um, uh, some of our most difficult cases because they there's no income, there's no asset. They'll go down to twenty five thousand. They'll do commercial loans. They'll cross collateralize. 
lots and lots of uh, really great things. No appraisal uh, that is actually done. Um, and uh, Geraldo is just one of the nicest people that you'll get to work, work with there. Uh, hopefully not too much because he's uh, he's uh, the guy that collects the payments too. But um, he's uh, but if you uh, are fortunate enough to work with him, you'll definitely know that he cares about uh, yeah. cares about. And that's fantastic. And, and I understand finance to a point where there's financial setbacks. It could be a general contractor. It could be the project the inspection, something that threw the books off track. But as a lender, we have an obligation to get paid because we have principals who we borrowed this money from to lend it out who are counting on these payments to be made on a timely basis. So if it ends up being the case that you do become behind and it's out of the norm, we'll work with you. If it becomes habitual and a, a, fit, a habitual offender, then it's like, there's only so much that we can do. And if we have to go legal, we go legal. But I try to work every single angle before we get to that point of, let's just go ahead and file foreclosure. So. Well, I appreciate your compassion. I will tell you too, is that they um, do a couple things unique. Uh, when you, when we broke your loan to their company, uh, they advance uh, three thousand dollars towards the um, uh, out of the draw immediately uh, when you close. Re even if you haven't requested one, they just send you three thousand uh, dollars, which can be helpful. Another thing they do is that uh, I got my draw money most times, guys, in twenty four hours of the request. Like literally received it twenty four hours from when I requested the money, which outstanding. So. Uh, kudos there. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and jump on to the rest of the call. I mean, rest of this uh, workshop. Yes. And go on to the next uh, area. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Rado. I'm glad to see you. You look a lot better than when you talked to me on Friday, my friend. So definitely good a lot stuff. better. Beauty recovery yeah, to you. Yeah. All right. So um, back to the tax questions. Did anyone have anything uh, on tax sales that they felt they weren't clear on from the last? Uh, uh, workshop or anything else they would just curious about would like to know. Um, and, and for those of you who don't know, Raul uh, is my partner in presenting these uh, workshops. And uh, he's also been a client with me for seven, eight years. We've been associates. We've gone back and forth where I was a client of his towards a client of mine. Um, but we work hand in hand uh, uh, quite a bit. He's a uh, very, very avid real estate investor himself, probably I would, if I had to guess, at least 40 properties under your belt, maybe a hundred. Well, over the years, yeah, maybe, uh, you know, so, but um, well, yeah, 40 since I, I know. I would say at least 40 since I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's a uh, very steady, steady work. Um, okay, yeah. Let me see. Uh, similar Alan, to what our we, saying, we both have experience with tax sales. So, and then any questions we can't answer, What's fantastic about this workshop is that we have a co network of experts. We will at, we'll email those questions to Irina and get you the answer like right away, right? So anything on, we, we wanted to make sure we gave a little bit of a and a We know we kind of ran through it last time, right? So anyone have any questions on tax sales that we can do our best to address? Nobody, nobody, nobody. You know, real quick, I missed it last week. I apologize. I've been working on some projects. But Arn, did you record that so I can go back and watch it? We we, we did. It was, uh, you look for one that says 9-13, uh, the recording date. Um, okay. I have it on the LLC Facebook page and the uh, group, uh, Azal Funding uh, University group. Uh, okay. It is posted there. Um, Perfect. I'm also going to be adding these videos into the library on our actual web uh, landing page uh, going forward. So there'll be multiple ways you'll be able to see them so you don't miss them. Uh, you know, th there's good information there. Uh, went kind of fast, so there might be some things you have questions about for sure. Good no question, problem. how to access thank information. Yeah thank, yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. And for those of you who haven't joined, please join Unstoppable Funding University uh, on the Facebook group. Um, it is a great, great resource uh, in connecting uh, individuals to really accelerate uh, your progress uh, in the business. Um, and that's my opinion, but I, I'm, I know that so many of you are here and the take advantage of the morning ones have definitely chimed in. 
I think that's why Geraldo like says, Hey, I'm an ICU, but I gotta, I want to reach out and let them know that, Hey man, I've been sick. That's why I'm not there. Cause it's, it's important wow. to him. Um, I, you know, so that's just fantastic. Um, okay. So Raul is going to present to us today on a couple of topics um, that, of something that, that uh, we provide and we want to cover a whole wide range of, in, in these classes, there's the whole world of finance, and then there's a the whole world of just buying and selling and fixing up, renting out, and everything to do with investing in real estate. So we're going to be covering all of these in the workshop. In the financing side, we've covered uh, the uh, lending we can get through private companies for fix and flip uh, specifically. So specifically fix and flip loans that our company provides. So as a we're able to comment on that as a broker, as a lender, as an investor, uh, we've been able to address what we can do uh, specifically, but we are not the only resource, okay? And this is not all about what uh, strictly the what I can do for you with our, our company. This is about empowering you so you can be a success in investing in real estate using all the different sources. So we're going to be covering uh, seller, seller financed options getting other investors involved, um, doing uh, uh, partnerships and um, unsecured financing, uh, gap funding and transactional funding. Um, and, and I'm sure there's more, okay? There's, there's, there's more. And we, as we, uh, as you will see, we'll be covering uh, all of them. Uh, Raul is going to be covering for us today uh, transactional funding and gap funding primarily. Um, and, uh, these are really important tools. Not all of them are going to be used for fix and flips, uh, for, uh, the person actually planning to do the fix and flip project, but they might be, there's different ways that they can tie in. And sometimes a lot of these will just spot, uh, spark an idea in your head. And it's, up to you to figure out how you can best use that to gain the leverage to accomplish what you want to do or or make money. Um, I I just want to say that one of the things that uh, I love about Raul's product is it will allow someone with no money, no credit, no anything to go out and make money within the next week as possible and. Uh, and, and put money in their pocket immediately. Um, I think Lisa is still here. I don't know. We've got a lot of people here, so I don't see everybody. Um, but Lisa was in our first series of classes. She utilized Raul to provide transactional funding for what happened is she found a property, um, needed to be bought cash. And uh, she used Raul's services to provide the cash for it to be wholesaled. And uh, she was able to make, uh, after paying everything out, she was able to make a clean $5,000. It was her first foray in it. So I thought that was pretty pretty awesome uh, that somebody can do that. So uh, what we're gonna do with, uh, with our speakers, and I wanna make this announcement uh, here, uh, before we got a little bit derailed with the questions during the speaker, uh, when Irina was talking and then some of the other classes, that can be a little bit distracting not just for the class, but also for the listeners. So what we're gonna ask you to do is go ahead and put those in to the text. And at the end of Raul's presentation, we're gonna go back through and address those first, and then we'll have a little bit of a Q and A. So without further ado, uh, Raul, I did allow uh, for you to have uh, sharing screen access if you'd like. Cool. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So some of the folks here have, uh, have already had some experience in it. So just as a recap and a jump off from kind of what Arne said is, you know, we are finishing up our first series of like these finance workshops. And if folks were here, you know, the idea that we had is, you know, taking you through that whole process, right, of going from money to finding the property all the way to execution in a series of workshops. So to kind of summarize a little bit so that we can kind of see where transactional funding falls is as Arn mentioned, there's like other buckets, right? We know that there's loans. We know that part, right? We know that you can use your own money or family's money to buy properties. We know that too. So what him and I wanted to do is do a series on 
alternative financing. And there's some folks in here that are a little bit more savvy investors that really kind of understand that concept, right? And we want to bring that information to you all to once again, be able to make real money in real time right now, right? So a couple of the other buckets that we will talk about a little bit are things like capital partners, right? Capital partners are going to be people that fund with you. They don't want to do the sweat equity. They don't want to find the property half the time, right? They don't want to swing the hammer, or oversee the management. They don't want to oversee the sales and marketing, but they do provide the money. Right. And so capital partners is going to be something we're going to talk about some do's, don'ts, right? Some things to look for because it is quite effective. Another one that we'll talk about is, of course, is um, seller financing. Arn has some experts. Uh, some of us have done seller financing, right? Land contracts and other options. Really great options for the right type of product. Right. And again, you all will hear us talk about this a lot. We want to provide you tools for your tool belt you decide based on the project, right? If you have a great tool belt and you're like, I need to knock this wall down, well, it may not be a screwdriver, right? Maybe it's a sledgehammer. Now you got that tool for that right project. Another one that we'll talk about, of course, is unsecured loans. A lot of people feel like, hey, look, if I don't have collateral, how do I get a loan? There are some opportunities out there, um, companies out there that provide unsecured, uncollateralized loans. And we'll talk a little bit about that and see if that's gonna be an option for you all. Um, so now we're getting into this concept of transactional funding, which is one of these ways. Now, I'm sure any of us that are on here have probably looked at other educational opportunities in real estate. And how many people have heard that line, uh, make money right now in real estate with no money at all? I, I, I mean, I've seen that 50 million times and I'm like, well, how does that even happen? And then I go in there and they're pitching me on a book and a program. And now they want $3,000 and they want me to sign up for a monthly this. And then they send me a list. And then they're like, here's this list of properties for you to go figure out. I'm like, you know, I could do that. I mean, I could, honestly, I can get on 50 lists and do that. And so when R and I kept talking about this, we're like, why are people paying for this thing? Like, this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't give them any elbow assistance at the elbow assistance, excuse me. And so this is something that we'll do. We'll not only want to talk to you about it and great if you can work with us, but we'll also be able to work with you, consult with you and provide you some knowledge so you can reduce that learning curve, right? And really be profitable quickly. So I'm going to jump in right now into transactional funding. Other people have heard about this thing. You may have heard it called double closing or an A to B, B to C. The difference is that world has opened up. Before, transactional funding was really about um, let me do the screen share now. Let me see how I do this. Uh, never to, there we go, right? And share. So real quickly, transactional funding, right? The reason why I call this like the best kept secret is because honestly, I've been doing this since uh, 99, 98, 2000, I've been in real estate. And I only learned about this less than 10 years ago. And I'm like, I, I wish I would have known about this product or really a solution a long time ago, because what it allows me to do is, again, set, buy and sell properties very quickly without my own money. But also what it allows me to do is monetize as, monetize opportunities that may not have been perfect for me, right? Once we get into this thing of finding deals, folks, there's going to be a ton of deals. You're like, that's really good, but it's not in my area. It's not quite the project that I want to do, right? Maybe I, I'm already tied up. You know, I have three projects going on and I don't want to over leverage myself. So here's what transactional funding can do, right? Transactional funding is essentially what, what you're going to do is going to do a double close. And let me share, you know, I'll go over this thing in a little bit. Let me share one other part of my screen. Give me one other second here. Uh, stop share and then share again. And I apologize. I'm not the best with this stuff. So now we're going to share again. Let me see here, share again. Oops, still can't get it.
All right. Sorry about that. So, you know, basically what is transactional funding? And and by the way, anyone that wants to um, email um, myself, I can send you all this in writing, of course, right? So that you can kind of take a look at it. Um, just put your email in the chat or just, you know, let R know and I'll, I'll pass that information on forward. But essentially transactional funding is a short-term funding, right? Provided to someone that wants to wholesale or buy and sell a property quickly. So this isn't, we're not a lender in the sense of you're going to take a financing for 30 days or 60 days or a year. That's where we go to R for that stuff, right? What I provide is a very subsect of it, a very niche one. And essentially it's what they would call a double close, right? It's when you put a property using that same example that Arn gave before, right? You have a property that you found for a hundred thousand. You know that you can put in 40,000 and you can sell it for 200,000. But for whatever reason, right, it's just not fitting your business model right now. Again, you could be over leveraged. It's in a different area. It's too far away. It's not really, you know, your cup of tea. So then you find somebody else. And I'm like, hey, Arn, I got this really, really great deal. And I'd like to sell it to you for 115. You're going to put 40 into it. You're going to make 20, uh, 200,000 at the end. You're going to make a net profit of 45,000. Arn says, sounds good to me. I like the project. I checked it out. So now I have a contract with someone to buy it for 100, and I have a second contract with Arn to sell it for 115. So I will essentially net 15,000 minus closing costs, right? So the first question is, why would I do that? Because like agents, it, you can do what they call assignment fees. You can say, hey, look, Arn, I'm gonna send you this contract for 115, and I'm assigning my rights, right? And I'm assigning that right for the cost of 15,000, right? And in this point, I'm marrying the two, right? I'm marrying Arn, the, the buyer, or what we would call the C, with the original seller, which is the A, I'm the B, I'm the middle person here, right? But why would I, you know, the main reason is for assignments though, there are some stipulations. The reason why people use transactional funding is really three main reasons. Number one, of course, you don't have to use your own money. Number two is you control the deal. Now, what we mean by that is a couple of things. You don't want to have to share that information because when I tell Arn, hey, by the way, Arn, I'm now connecting you to the original seller. Maybe on the next deal, Arn doesn't need me, right? Because he can just go direct to that person at this point because I am going to have to disclose all that information. Second reason, of course, is the fee. The moment Arn sees that I'm making 15,000, he may feel some kind of way. You know, what Arn doesn't see or what these clients don't see is the years that you all have put into it, how many deals have not worked out, right? All the effort that it took to get to that point. And then the third reason is sometimes they're just not assignable. A lot of times when you're buying like government owned properties, foreclosures, sometimes bank owned properties, right? They will disallow assignments. They'll say, we really don't want you wholesaling this. We don't want you doing this. So with transactional funding, you're abiding by their terms because we're actually funding just like cash. We're going to fund that deal. So you will close that asset out. You will close that transaction for a hundred thousand out. Right. And then very, the same day you're selling it for that 115. So you're actually having two separate closings, i.e. double close. On the very same day, the difference is someone has to actually put up that 100000 right? About transactional funding, again, there's nothing to do with credit because this is all about the strength of the project, right? If you have a, a PA for 100 to buy and a second PA to sell for 115 and the title company has cleared the title, everybody has done their inspections, everything is good to go, it doesn't make a difference about a, a, a credit score or not. Um, are there any minimum amounts? No, not at all. There's no minimum. You can do it for 20,000. You can do it for 200,000. You can do it for $2 million. So you can do it on commercial or other assets too. Um, can you use any title company? We are, we open and work with a lot of different title companies, but title companies are really important. So we have a phenomenal network of title companies that are very investor specific. But if you have a, a reason to work with a different title company, we're open. As long as we get to talk to them and understand their process, we're good to go. So the other piece I wanted to talk about with transactional funding, give me one second, I got to stop the screen share again, is overall, like 
essentially what that process looks like. What's the A, you know, what is step-by-step? -step, what does that look like? So let me open that one up, please. Share screen. So process is pretty much five steps, right? Number one is you're going to send over the PA. Hey, here's the PA for me purchasing it. And here's the purchase agreement for me selling it. Great. The moment you send that over to us, we're going to immediately start talking to you about what the deal looks like, right? If it's the first time, we're going to do a discovery call. We're going to talk you through it. See what this all looks like. If it's your second, third, fourth, fifth, seventh, eighth time, no problem. We, we're going to move right away. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to confirm the top with the title company, right? And make sure things are moving in the right way, right? Hey, you know, where's the title commitment? Where are we in terms of the overall process? One of the things that we do in sound management with transactional funding is we offer what we call transaction coordination services. And what that essentially is, is everything between the PA and the closing, we're going to start interacting with the title company on your behalf with you copied along the way. So that investors can do what they're supposed to do, which is focus on finding the next deal rather than just pushing paperwork. If we need something, something signed, an addendum, a document, and want you to review something, naturally, we're going to email you and say, hey, can you take a look at this? Can you get this over to us? But we essentially act as like an administrative assistant so that we can cut about on average three to five hours out of that deal time. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to review that whole process once we're getting close to closing. We send you an investor agreement for e-signature. So if folks are familiar with double closings or transactional fundings, the model used to be often that they have you sign a mortgage or some kind of security instrument that they then basically tear up. We don't do any of that. This is 100% black and white, 100% above board. We at, we're an investment firm and we're going to invest with you for a one-day transaction. So you're going to sign that document that clarifies all that documents what fees will be charged and so forth and then we close we follow behind the paperwork we work with you all in, in processing it and we make sure that we are we close in a timely timely fashion so that is the essential process with when it comes to transactional funding right you are doing you're essentially wholesaling or double closing a property you want another company to put up the money for you because you don't want to tie up your own money we're closing that first transaction, right? So that you can then close that second transaction. And we are essentially getting paid on that second transaction. We'll literally be just like a payoff, right? Right on that HUD saying, okay, he's gonna, you know, you know, it's gonna be a hundred thousand that's owed to sound management plus whatever their whatever the fee is, right? I get the remaining balance and you're closed out without any dollars out of your pocket. We can fund all of it which is what most people want, or we can fund as much as you say you want to fund. So you may say, okay, look, you know, I, I just need funding for a hundred of that, um, 90 of that hundred thousand. Okay. Our fees only based on the money that we, that we um, invest out. And then of course, you know, we follow up with the title company and make sure things are done in a timely and, and accurate fashion. Um, a couple other things that kind of differentiate us a little bit are, we are a company, number one, in terms of fees, we have some of the lowest overall minimum fees in the nation. Number two, we do that transaction coordination, which I can't tell you how critical it is because it's even a standalone service that we provide. When we were doing more and more projects, we realized that, again, on every file, we're spending anywhere between three and five hours just talking to people, emailing, making sure things are right. That's just a lot of time that we really should have focused right on getting the next deal. Because in that three hours, we could have found a new deal. So what we did is we streamlined it and we said, we're going to have like an admin assistant work on that. And then eventually other investors were like, look, you know, I can't really afford an admin assistant. Why not just go ahead and, you know, provide this service for a file? We figured it makes sense for transactional funding, so we include it. The third thing is, you know, we provide a profit share program, right? So if you refer us out to anyone, we're firm, firm believers in sharing the wealth. We really, really believe that's the best way. To, we don't want you to pitch us. You don't need to say, okay, this is the best thing in, on earth. We want to earn people's business. So we just say, hey, here's a here's a tool. Raul, meet Alfonso. Alfonso, meet Raul. They do transactional funding. God bless you.
We'll pay you profit shares on, on the deals that we do to them. It's just our way of saying thank you and building out this really, really good network. Um, so at this point, that's the synopsis. Usually the, the meat is in the questions. So uh, without further ado, I'm opening it up to questions. Do people have questions on transactional funding in terms of any of the process itself? I didn't notice, I wasn't looking at the chat. So if anyone has sure. any, do you wanna just raise your hand or Ali, did you see any questions already? Uh, there was a good question from Drew, I noticed. Um, he asked, he said, what happens um, if you're doing a cash transaction? Let me refine it here. Um, if you're in a contract that is unassailable and he closes, what happens if my end buyer decides not to close at the last minute? Great question, right? Great question. So what, to, to mitigate that issue, we always make sure that we, almost always, we try to close the B2C first, which is the second transaction, right? Because if that second transaction doesn't close, nothing's happening with the first. So you're 100% right, 100% right. Now, I'll be honest with you, 20% of the time, people disclose they're doing a double close, right? 80% of the time, they don't because there's nothing that that forces them to do so. Because again, you're abiding by that first PA, you're closing it out. Whether you end up reselling it or keeping it and doing a fix and flip, that's completely up to you, right? But great question. And that's one of the things, Drew, that we do over time, right? We've been doing this for about five years. And that's one of the key things that our best practice guide, right? When is the best time to do it? What are the times that you really want to be clear in disclosing it? Drew leads to a really good question, right? Which is he mentioned something really critical. Back in the day, it was always cash to cash. The first transaction's cash, right? We're, we're setting literally a wire, right? In cash. And then you're getting your funds in cash. However, because of this explosion and fix and flips and so forth, right? And working with really, really sophisticated and savvy loan brokers like Arn. That's one of the big things that him and I started working on is, well, can we do this with an end buyer that needs a loan? And the answer is yes. So you are buying in cash and then you're selling to someone that now can get a fix and flip or a different type of loan to finance that purchase, right? Of course, it's a little bit more sophisticated. We got it. There's a more moving uh, wheels in there, right? But that's where that's where kind of someone like Unstoppable is really good because they're aware, right? They're familiar. And so what's going to happen is the loan broker and I are going to really coordinate a lot to make sure the timing is well, that the title company is fully aware of kind of what's going on. But for you trying to monetize, imagine the pool now. You're not just finding people that could buy the property for 115 in cash, which is a pool that big. Now you can say, oh, well, if you want financing for it, there's an opportunity. If you don't have a financing company, naturally, I can refer one to you. Unstoppable does this thing all day long, right? Or if you have your own financing company, let me know because I want to get my title company and transactional funder talking to everyone, right? So we can make sure this is coordinated well. And so now what's happening is you're buying cash and you're selling to someone that's going to close with a loan. Your purchase price is still your purchase price. There's no change in that. And you're still going to make the same kind of profits. The difference is the people you can sell to is a much bigger pool of people. Good question. Anyone else? Thank you, Raul. Um, so yeah, I want to uh, reiterate. So I don't know if everybody's really grasping how powerful this is, okay? So this is powerful because if you wanted to get into wholesaling and you don't, have the intention of fixing it up and flipping it yourself, uh, you might have some fear about uh, making an offer to put a house under contract, um, especially if it's bank owned, for instance. Like a really prime example would be a bank owned property, which are often some of the best. So Raul's program would allow you to close on that with the bank. And uh, so you, what you would do is you'd sign a contract that would probably be 30 days. Um, uh, normal length of term contract or uh, it means that you have to close in the 30 days. You would then talk to Raul and go, Raul, I am, I'm buying this house and I'm planning to wholesale it. Um, would you be able to buy the transactional funding when it sells? Um, you know, when it, when it goes to closing. So then what you would have to do is find someone that's going to buy the property, either cash or some other means or financed 
from you. So you would set up a se separate purchase agreement uh, on the same property from yourself to the person that plans to buy it from you and, and fix it up or use it for whatever purposes they have in mind. Um, we as the lender, you would provide us both contracts. We would, because we can see what the original contract was, we see what the new one is, we uh, submit both to the lender. The lender looks at those, make sure of the numbers, they do their evaluations and they approve the end buyer. At the closing though, the, uh, the you as the wholesaler would have to come up with the money to pay for that property, okay? Without that money to pay for the property, um, you don't you, you don't close. So in other words, some people might say, well, why don't they just use the transact? Uh, so I'm selling it, why don't they just use that? Why bother with it? Well, because it's not legal. At one point it was legal, but it's not legal anymore. So that means you have to come up, the title company can't do it that way. They can't use the money from the other closing to fund the first one. So if there's two closings, it has you have to have the money for the first closing uh, and, and actually close it. And for a moment in time, you actually own that property. Then uh, in the same day, you, you will sell it and, uh, and, and complete the sale uh, to the uh, end buyer. And uh, the, the house gets uh, paid off because what will happen is on the new HUD, it's going to show the money that you owe to Raul's company plus their fee. And uh, it'll show the new, um, uh, your proceeds will be whatever price you sold to that person for. So if you sold to them for 115, paid 100,000. So it'll show that you owe 100,000 to Raul. So on your closing statement, that 100,000 will just come straight off. And that's yeah. how it works. And, and there's a couple of good, thank you, Arn. I, I really appreciate it, man. There's a couple of good questions that came up, but you know, Arn, you raised a really good point that I, I should have mentioned. One of the good things that we do is we do provide POFs. So for proof of fund letters, right? So for example, Arn would say, hey, look, you know, I got, like you said, you're going to call me. I got these, you know, two PAs or I got this PA role, or you can say, look, I really want to bid on this house, right? And can you send me a POF? Because my goal is to eventually wholesale it, right? At that point, you would email me, send me the information, right? And I'll provide you a proof of funds letter basically saying, hey, look, you know, our company provides this line to Arn, right, to buy and sell properties. And then you have a POF so that when you submit that contract, that purchase agreement, you can say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be buying it like cash because you are. There is no appraisal with us. There's no, nothing like that. It's all about the deal itself, Right. So it is a feature that we can, and we, we do it within 24 hours that you can absolutely get a, a proof of funds letter so that you can compete and get that contract, right? Two questions came up that I wanted to address. Drew asked a, a really good question. I believe Drew, you asked, well, what happens if one side closes and the other doesn't essentially, right? Because now what's happening is, hey, I am not able to complete my side. So let's say in the same example, um, he is unable, for whatever reason, the end buyer or whatever happens, you know, the, the end buyer, the C does not close, right? Now you're on the hook for the A to B to close, but they didn't put up their money, right? So two things, what would happen in the worst case scenario, if you're not able to restructure the deal and get some additional time or get the problem resolved, naturally, as you know, your material, right? Interest on that A to B is your EMD. Right. If you are unable to perform, you're going to lose that EMD. Correct. But remember, you're going to collect one, too. So you may say, hey, look, on my A to B, I got a thousand dollar EMD. Most of the times on that B to C, that second one, you're going to make it a thousand or fifteen hundred. So that worst case scenario doesn't close your break even. If not, maybe you make a couple of bucks. Great question. But that's absolutely one of the things we do during that discovery call. When you are doing it the first couple of times, we want to walk you through this. We want to say, okay, well, what does it look like? Let's marry the terms. Well, I'm going to say, ah, if you got a 10-day inspection on the first one, you need to give them seven because you don't want to get caught, right, in that little in-between. Hey, what are some best practice stuff on when to close? That's what we, we want to do. We want to increase your, your, your profitability and your success rate. And over the years, we've learned um, some really key things in terms of creating those two contracts, right? Um, 
Other question that came up is, um, what is the difference between this and an assignment contract, right? Great question again. In an assignment, remember what you're doing is you're marrying the two parties. You're basically saying rather than two closings, there's going to be one. But I'm going to connect you, the original seller, to you, the end buyer, and I'm just going to be in the middle for a fee. So yes, there are some cost savings there. You're 100% right. The issue becomes, and we've seen this time and time and time again, is one is privacy and two, disclosing how much you're making. The moment they dis you disclose how much you're making, sometimes people all of a sudden, when it was 115 was perfect, 115 is not so good anymore. Why are you making this much money? You're not doing any work. Or what about this? What about that? There's that. And the other reason is, remember, you are going to marry the two, meaning I you have to disclose who that original buyer is. They, they know their name. They know this. So in a very unlikely chance, right, we always believe people are positive. Maybe they figure they can just wait the contract out and go direct, maybe. Or the next time, why go to you? I'm just going to go direct to this this investor directly. So you keep your privacy. And as you know, with this with this investment in real estate world, your knowledge and your network is a prime resource, right? We we absolutely believe in sharing, but you got to be able to protect your essentially your IP, right? Your intellectual property in that situation. Um, Drew, I saw the question come up and pop off. Can you, do you mind just taking yourself on mute and asking the question one more time? Because I, I can't see it again. Yeah, no worries. Um, <clears throat> so my my follow-up question is the reverse. What mm -hmm. if you have the first closing, the buyer, the end buyer closes, but at the last minute, the seller decides to back out? Great question. You, you would then, um, you would have a material damage. You know, you wouldn't close the second one, right? And then mm -hmm. you would basically, you know, you would be able to say, hey, look, you did not perform. I will have to force you to perform. But again, this is where, you know, the timing of it all and stuff like that is what we do really critically. Usually it's I haven't seen that situation. We've seen it one time, but that person got in a car accident and then we just reschedule the closing. And so we just we want to make sure those things are happening in a simultaneous fashion. So if there's any inclination of any issues, absolutely, you know, we'd be there. But remember, at that point, you have a contract that forces them to perform. You would essentially be able to force a sale or sue for material damage, which would say, hey, look, I was about to make 15,000. I need, you need to pay me that 15,000. And here's what, what it looks like. And I put a lien on your property for that. Okay. Good question. But this is where that, um, I really believe in preparation, folks. I can't tell you like, why that communication all the way through is so critical because those last three days uh, for whatever reason you could have it perfect but things pop off uh, everyone's been there just all of a sudden everything was perfect in the last three days before closing all these questions come up right so this is where having a team is really useful so folks like the questions that drew asked are absolutely make sense right but if you have a lender this is where talking to the johns of the world is really useful right if you have a transactional funding or a title company that's where we talk to them and say, hey, look, what does this kind of look like? What do these scenarios look like? Because you really do want to have a team behind you. And that's one of the benefits of, of this of this uh, solution. You're not only going to get me and teammates that I work with, but you're also going to get these really good title companies that really, really, really will have your back uh, because we work with them a lot. And a lot of the same ones that John and I, we share for that specific reason. So we can say, hey, look, between us, we're going to create a certain volume that they're going to really, really want to cater to our clients. Great question again. It's at the one o'clock hour, Arn. You know, I know, you know, we're, we're steadfast about timing. So I wanted to pass it forward to you. Folks, if you have other questions, these are great. Email me. If you're interested in it, if you don't mind putting your email in the chat, Allie, if you don't mind just cutting, and pasting and sending it to me, I'd really appreciate it. And then I will shoot you out this literature and then we can even set up a discovery call where we can just talk about uh, questions you have and scenarios you may you know you may think about so you can see that this is the right fit thank you Arn. yeah and i you know drew had a good follow-up uh statement there just said it sounds much better than having to disclose that you're wholesaling a property yeah. so many people hate the idea because wholesalers have such a bad reputation um and that's that's really true so it's, it helps uh conceal uh the profit that you're making um, because you're able to actually 
because you actually take possession of the property and then are able to sell it. Um, it's such a powerful tool once you understand it and you're able to use it. Um, Raul has quite a bit more uh, when you have individual situations that you uh, can exploit it even farther. So I definitely invite you to get to get to know Raul and to reach out on your own individual situation and see what else uh, is possible. Um, they uh, also, I, just to touch on very briefly, Raul is also versed in providing um, or investing, uh, if you will, in uh, possibly other aspects uh, called gap funding, um, which would help bridge the gap for maybe a shortage of the amount of money you have for down payment or closing cost or participation in some uh, avenue there. But that, that would be just, uh, you know, you have a particular situation and you would just go through the whole scenario with Raul going buying it for this, um, selling it for that. My buyer doesn't quite have enough money. Is there a way to bridge the gap? And uh, he can possibly help you out with uh, solutions. And that's what we're all about is trying to find, trying to find solutions that, that work, uh, that are straightforward, that are ethical, and uh, make the lenders happy, make you happy, make everyone happy. That's our goal. <laughs> and I will tell you that every lender is going to be different um, as to what they allow and don't allow. And so we have to be cognizant um, about, about that as well. And uh, you definitely have to be open-handed um, with what you do and follow those rules. Um, some of the lenders just don't ask, and that's the way they deal with it. Um, other ones have clear-cut rules. These are the rules. And you need, and, and concealing it for them would be a problem, and, and, and you don't want to do that. So um, you know, make sure that you navigate this. Uh, with some experts. Uh, Raul is definitely an expert in that area and will keep you safe and doing it right. So um, that said, I, I, Raul, thank you so much for what you shared. Uh, I thought that was thank great. And uh, I promised uh, uh, Damon uh, that he might be able to show the video for Alfonso has it. Alfonso, do you have it up to where you can show it? Accessible? All right. So I'm not the most savvy one in this and sharing thing, but I did just text it to you. You texted it to me. Yeah. All right. Well then, um, are you I did not are you say because I've been I'm here? Yeah. Uh, I am. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can. Um, I might be able to do this real quick. You all are gonna want to see this because I'm telling you, it's a it's a beautiful beautiful transition. Beautiful. All right. Got the first one in. And we get the second one in. Raul, great presentation, my man. Thank you. You know, I was going to reach out. I was going to mention to you. Al and I have worked on plenty of these. So he can tell, mm -hmm. definitely tell you about the pitfalls and the necessity to communicate. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> that up and share it with everybody. I will tell you that something really weird happens with the colors for some reason every time I play video through Zoom. So I just want to preface that that uh, may be the case here. So I apologize for that in advance. All right, guys, uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we're going to go ahead and start. This will be my first time seeing it as well. So that's the main level um, of the town of the um, the property, and you can see it's an open concept now. Wow. You have the staged already, Damon? Yes, it got staged yesterday. Oh man, nice! Hey, all right, I told you he ain't wasted no time. <laughs> Get this thing <laughs> on the market, <laughs> Damon. Uh, do you do, do you have a if you don't mind sharing it with the class, what do you hope to uh, to to um, get a, get as a return on this? And here's you know, the other. We're kind of we're kind of bummed a little bit because there was a property 
not too far, I guess, on the other side of the street, that low ball they're offer. So um, we still, the, the type of renovation that we did was still more um, than what the, the other rehab, because it's a similar structure. So we're looking, um, let's see here, I'm going to put the numbers together, but as far as profit, not exclude, not including the, um, you know, the real estate fees, let's see here. Thank you so much. I mean, I, this is a really, really nice outcome. Yeah, we're looking at hopefully between um, probably between thirty to fifty thousand. All right, not bad for a first flip and uh, eight weeks work. Not bad. Uh, well, I mean, you probably have a little bit of time looking first, though. Um, uh, I don't know how long it took to find this house, right? But um, probably took a little bit of time there and a little bit of time to close, so. A few about three four months into it, and now, did you go? Does, did you do the work yourself, Damon, or did you contract? Absolutely it? not. <laughs> uh, this was done by a contractor that was uh, recommended by uh, my good friend Al, and um, they they did a real um, bang up job. I mean, they were there every day. Um, if we had any, uh, we did have a plumbing issue down in the basement. They rectified that. Um, so they were, they were there every day. Um, it was a couple of times I went there on a weekend. There was an electrician working on a weekend. So, um, I was very impressed about what they did and how fast they got it done. Cause you know, by my trade, I've been in a mortgage business as an underwriter for over 30 years. Um, so I, I used to hear the horror stories about these type of deals, I never experienced it personally, but uh, from what happened to me, I know it's an anomaly. It doesn't happen all the time, but uh, I'm glad it went the way it did for my first flip. If it if it does, um, if we do, if it does sell for what we're going to be listening for, um, the profit should be around seventy thousand, uh, and that's not including the um, real estate fees. Right. That's great stuff. Well, guys, I think that that's a wrap on today's class. Uh, thank you so much. Um, don't forget to join Ensemble Funding University group. And then daily, we do have the same link, 830. Just jump on, say hello if you want. You don't have to stay there. You can come and go as you want. Many people are there every day. So, you know, take advantage of it. If anybody has any quick questions, uh, they may ask right now. Lynette, we're going to wrap it up and then uh, you can definitely jump on. If you think about it later, jump on that class in the morning. It's a great place to catch me every day. All right. Thank you, everybody. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Later.